mostly because um, mostly because the what is going on in Chile is something that has is going on also in the U.S. right now. Uh, uh, this week, Physician for Human Rights has released a report about the use of non-lethal weapons in oh sorry less lethal weapons in the U.S., particularly in Portland. Um, Last year, we had several protests in Barcelona uh, in the context of the independency or the, the attempts of independency of Catalonia from Spain. And these weapons were used and people were injured. They, they have uh, occurred trauma victims. Um, then we have France uh, from 2016 to 2019 before the COVID, the yellow vest uh, protesters start being deal, dealt by police with uh, these kind of weapons and so on. And more recently in Belarus, uh, they start using also these weapons. Some of them I think uh, were manufactured by the UK. So what was going on in Chile is not an isolated event. And I think that we need to start discussing what are these uh, kinetic impact projects or, or what these uh, non-lethal weapons or less lethal weapons means for democracy for policy and for our future uh, in, 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 in every country. Uh, so I want to start with one definition um, because uh, we, we heard, and you can find any, a lot of documents talking about the non-lethal weapons. And then we found documents talking about less lethal weapons or less than lethal or soft kill, pre-lethal or so lethal or worse than lethal. So there are a lot of uh, uh, labels for trying to, to categorize these weapons. But the main idea, like, by design, what these weapons aims to do is to incapacitate people without causing death or permanent injury. And that's how a lot of government has said, OK, we don't want to kill. We are humane. We want to promise people that police are going to respect human rights and they are going to use non-lethal weapons or less lethal weapons. The problem is, the problem is that none of these weapons are completely self-safe. None of these weapons are actually non-lethal. And the problem that I think that the most serious issue is that the government, the army and police know this from the 70s. Like, uh, the Security Planning Corporation of the U.S. already in the 70s was actually saying, okay, we have a wide variety of weapons that are not intended to, to, to kill people. To the, the, they are not intended to kill or to create permanent injury, but if they're used in a regular basis or in certain situations, they might kill people or they may, may, might maim people. And, and the problem is, is that there is a disconnection between how the modern states are selling these weapons to us as citizens, how are they using them against citizens that are protesting, and the evidence that these governments know. So for example, you have heard about the taser, you have heard about chemical weapons, and this is another irony because like, Chemical weapons are forbidden to be to use in warfare. However, chemical weapons are often used in different countries, in the US, in Chile, and there are different chemicals, the CS, the OC, or PAVA. And but I will focus, I only I will only focus in this uh, presentation on what is going on with the kinetic impact projectiles. That they have many names. They have like bean bags, baton round, uh, rubber back shots. Uh, in, in the UK are known as uh, attenuated energy projectiles. Uh, in, in France, they are known as flash balls. In, uh, in Spain, they are known as pelota de goma. And in, in Chile, are known as perdigones de goma. But they are all the, kind, the same kind of, the same family of ammunition used against people. Uh, from the methodological perspective, what I'm aiming to do, what I'm trying to do now, but I, I don't have answers. I have a lot of questions, but I want to start with a reflection on Simone Biel. And when she was reflecting about warfare in the 30s, she said that the, the approach to armed violence uh, in trying to understand the, the goals pursue and know the nature of the means employed was flawed. We need to take into account uh, Less, uh, we, we need to take into account, we need to understand what these weapons can do to actually understand what these armored 
uh, violent means. More recently, uh, Gregor Chamayou, in his work of the theory of drone, he rescued these words by Simone Biel, and he proposed the same kind of approach. If we want to understand what these weapons means, we need to understand the technical mechanics behind it, because the technical behavior of these weapons will create actions and also will create limitation for actions. And therefore, by only by understanding the medical and ballistics evidence, we can actually pursue a ban for some of these weapons, or we can actually demand government to offer a better regulation of those weapons. Uh, my apology if, if my if I'm going to pass or my or if you don't understand my thick accent, but just let me know, but I will try to be as clear as I can. So um, what are kinetic impact projectiles? Again, they are designed to inflict pain. So they, they, they on, on paper, this is amazing because on paper, they are they look like an amazing tool for states. They are, they, are, they are only aimed to produce blunt trauma, which is like when, when uh, in Spanish we said moretones, which is like basically they are not aiming to penetrate, they're only aiming to produce pain or to make people to say, okay, you're protesting in a violent way, oh, you're going to be dealing with some pain, our police officers will be at certain range, so they are not going to be harmed, they're not going to interact, so we are going to have better crowd control. The problem is up to this date, none of these weapons are non-lethal, despite the fact of how government tried to justify the use as non-lethal. And the problem is that because there is a disconnection between how they sold us these weapons and the damage that these weapons can produce, uh, we are seeing a lot of maiming and in some cases, uh, people are dying because of this, the use of these weapons. Um, so the problem here is like, yes, I mean, from a technique, from a ballistic perspective, we can say that these weapons are less efficient in killing than live ammunition. However, they are very efficient maiming. And the, the current state of this weapon is that they are very, very good maiming. And if you start tracing all the evidence for the last 20 years of ocular trauma, you will find that they have blinded a lot of people. The, the, the more horrible cases, you can find them in India right now, in, in the situation in Kashmir and, and Jammu. However, you will find blinded people in France, in uh, Spain, in Chile, and in the US right now. Um, and, and, and then uh, Jonathan Rosenkett in the 70s, uh, he was criticizing the use of these weapons in Northern Ireland. And, and he was making a point that are still valid for this day. So th there is a thin line between uh, producing a blunt trauma and producing serious injury. So the problem here is like, if we shoot these weapons at short range, is there is a high chance that we're going to kill someone. If we shoot at long range, they are, complete, they are very inaccurate. So therefore there is a high chance that I'm going to harm innocent people. I'm, I'm not going to shoot the, 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 the target. And, and, and despite this evidence, uh, they are still being used. And again, I want to I want to claim here there is a pledge, and, and this pledge has been to a certain extent being uh, allowed by the United Nations because from the 70s the United Nations said uh, that the government should use non-lethal weapons. And then only lately, only very recently, the United Nations start realizing that the non-lethal weapon has become uh, a problem. They are being used to kill, they are being used to maim, and therefore the main fear in the 70s, like do the government should not kill protesters, has been transformed into government should not maim protesters. Uh, so there is a chief between this kind of, uh, okay, we, 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 we can kill you, to, okay, we may maim you. And, and, and there is a, 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 a complete, uh, we need to start make states uh, responsible, like, for these decisions. But the problem is that whenever we discuss this with police, police said, okay, if we can't use this weapon, we are going to kill people. Right. Um, and I think that that's one of the problematic issues because uh, in all, all the criminologists that are working in, in with uh, prison issues will, will be familiar with the concept of net widening. But basically this is a concept where uh, community sentences are proposed and, and they are sold to us as a way to, as an alternative to imprisonment. 
However, in practice, net widening means that they are not replacing prison men, but they're actually, they are enacting uh, more severe uh, regimes uh, against certain populations. So therefore, if Therefore, they are they are increasing in in the long term. They are increasing the use of, of imprisonment, uh, and therefore, what is going on with these weapons is something similar. If I introduce these weapons, police are using them in situations where, in the past, they will have never used that such force, and therefore, the introduction of this is allowing the brutalization of police. Um, so, okay, in terms of in terms of, of, of more technical aspect of this. Uh, one way to judge uh, the kinetic impact projectiles is to try to consider two factors. Um, uh, effectiveness in terms of making people stop protesting and safety. However, the more pain that I can produce, the less safe. The more safe, the less effective. So that, that, so that again poses the question, so why use them for crowd control? Um, since the 70s, the US government this uh, has created certain threshold. And the threshold is like if the impact, uh, if the kinetic impact of the projectiles to the target is above 100, 120 joules, that's a little weapon. So the fact, the fact that many of these weapons could be a ball, a rubber ball, or could be a projectile that doesn't have, um, doesn't have a, a, a head, like a side around the head, uh, if, if, if they are shoot with a lot of energy, they can uh, broke bones. They have, they can kill people, or they can, in, they can produce internal bleeding. Therefore, like one thing, okay, how this can kill? Well, if, if, if the energy is uh, uh, higher, it's like if you have one more than one hundred twenty joules, you can kill. Now, let's look some kind of the ballistics evidence in terms of which are the damages that they can produce at different energies, and we can see that between 40 and 100, uh, 120 joules, when they are not lethal, they can cause dangerous wounds like bruises, abrasion, broken ribs, concussion, blindness, and damage to internal organs and to the liver, for example. Uh, Beer and Stewart found that they can fracture ribs as lower as 28 joules. They can fracture the breastbone at 94 joules, and they can tear of the liver at 100 and 100 four joules. Clearly, when they are fired at more than 120 joules, they can produce death. But there is another trick here. The closer the target is to the shooter, the higher the impact the projectile will have. So therefore, like, if we shoot at a very short distance, five, uh, five meters or 10 meters, it's highly likely that you could kill. And also, if you shoot to the upper part of the body, you can also kill because there are the other problem is that not all the part of our body are um, uh, can tolerate this kind of impact in the same way. So therefore, the more sensitive part is the upper part of the body, and the fact is the large amount of people that have been blinded suggests that a lot of police are shooting to the head. Actually, the last report of Physician for Human Rights for the situation in the, US, in the United States is called Shot in the Head. This is a one, um, one a seminar paper wrote by Rohini Haaf of the Physician for Human Rights. She made a systematic review of the medical evidence of, this, uh, uh, of these weapons. And she found that they are very little. That she found that there are set, uh, some of them are more little than others, but all of them suggest that we can speak about non-lethality and we have to understand that they can produce serious injuries. And this poses the question of why they are so badly regulated everywhere. So here I want to discuss, and, and this is one that the, the, the title of this, uh, of this uh, presentation is inspired by a book by uh, Jasmir Puar. She's a professor of um, the University of Rutgers. And she wrote uh, this book, The Right to Maim, when she explored what is going on in Palestine and Israel. She, she came from the disability studies to what was going on. And, and something that I found very interesting about this problem is that uh, this decision of the states to shift between uh, weapons that can kill to weapons that can maim, what that means. What, what, what the use of these weapons means, particularly in the context of protesting people, 
that means that the, the government has a right to name individuals. And also this poses a lot of biopolitical questions because when you name citizens, that means that that citizen will have to live with that disability for the rest of their lives. So in Chile, we don't have uh, the National Health Service. So all the people that was named by the state, uh, if they don't have money to pay the, the insurance, they, they will not receive good quality of medical, atten uh, uh, medical attention. And many of them have lost their jobs because they cannot work. It. So basically what is going on is that because they were trying to protest against inequality and because they were protesting against austerity, they were made in such a way that it's not only physical, but an economical burden. And this will be different in different countries, but uh, we need to also try to understand the, the neoliberal logic about this. Uh, in Chile, for example, great part, there is a the great part of the support for people that has disabilities go through a charity. And every year they make this kind of uh, 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 charity funds for that and all the different kind of uh, big companies get money and therefore because they're supporting charities they have this tax reduction so there is a, a complete machine in terms of of how people are supported in a neoliberal machine of how people are supported in chile people with disabilities are supported in chile and, and therefore the, the, the question remains like like what what means that for a state to maim individuals? And of course, one, one, may say, my, one may say that the maiming of individuals are not what are intended by the government. Uh, that this may be just police brutality and this may just be in all isolated cases. But how many isolated cases can you have before you actually start thinking that there is a generalized a systematic attack against um, your population. And therefore, if there is a general and systematic attack, then you can start speaking about crime against humanity, which are the legal requirements to speak about criminal, uh, crimes against humanity. In Chile right now, the prosecution has said that the general, the, the general attack has, can be, you can argue that in Chile has been a general attack to public population. However, there is no agreement if this has been systematic. Uh, okay, I, here I, I talk about this already. Um, a brief genealogy of this uh, is that these uh, weapons were introduced uh, in the 50s by the UK in the Asian colonies. These were the first kind of weapons that were wood buttons. Uh, they were made for being shot to the ground and the ricochet of it will actually injure people in the, um, in the legs. However, this was so dangerous that they start killing people because uh, even if you if the ricochet was so inaccurate that they start like uh, uh, injury like innocent people. Um, what is very interesting is that if you trace, if you make a genealogy of these weapons, you will find that they were created for colonial in colonial territories, and therefore the way they were introduced in a rationale for people that were not considered citizens, or they were not considered national, and therefore they were considered in a different kind of paradigm. If you actually study the policy models in the, uh, of colonial policy in Asia, for example, in Hong Kong, in Malaysia, in, uh, in India, you will find that all these uh, police bodies were constructed as a militarized police body and they were prone to use lethal uh, violence against these people that were protesting. Now, here we come to a place, a very interesting paradigm for the UK. I think that the UK is, is very interesting because in Norfolk Island, the Rook has a more colonized uh, uh, organization. And actually, if you look to the police paradigm in, the, in, in England, Scotland, and Wales, you will find that the police uh, paradigm model used in those countries were completely different to a more. So therefore, despite the fact that the, the British will never say that Northern Ireland was a colony, the fact is was that police was constructed as colonial police. And that's why in the 70s, uh, the UK introduced several of these weapons in, um, in Northern Ireland. And of course, between the 70s and the 80s, they killed several, uh, they killed 17 people mostly children, and more than 600 people was injured by these uh, bullets uh, in between the troubles. Um, 
and this in and, and in this um, because they were introduced in the in in northern ireland a lot of countries in europe start seeing these weapons as an alternative so during the 80s france spain um a lot of Holland, uh switzerland start buying these weapons despite the fact that some of people were actually saying how can actually use this kind of colonial measures against our nationals so therefore you don't see that they, these weapons were used too, too much in, in the 80s uh, in Europe. However, they were start being used in Israel and Palestine uh, between, the eight, between 88 and 98, at least 58 Palestinian citizens died because of these uh, weapons. Um, between 2000 and 2013, at least 13 more people died and we are only counting death, not people that was maimed, no people that was injured. Um, also, uh, more recently in Kashmir and Jammu, uh, because they were using bill shots, uh, more than 1,200 people has been uh, had, had uh, ocular trauma. Once again, uh, we found that during the 90s, again, the European countries start repeating the pledge. You know what? We're going to use these weapons. We need to ensure public order. And during the late nineties, you start finding a lot of so a lot of countries start using it, particularly France, particularly um, uh, Spain, Spain as well. Also, uh, what is very interesting is that because of what happened in Northern Ireland, and because the the pattern report, uh, which was made in the in the peace process. Uh, uh, highlight how this weapon was badly regulated and caused death. Um, uh, they, these weapons were not used in, in England. Actually, what is a very interesting point, if you can check, is how the Met Police did not use them in, uh, uh, during the uh, London riots in 2011. And after the 2011 London riots, uh, one of the commanders of the police, of the Met Police, defend the decision of not using them because he said that he'd rather have people in jail rather than in hospitals. Um, nevertheless, during the last 15, 10 years, uh, the, the police forces in England has started using these weapons more and more. And as I mentioned it, uh, sorry, and you can find uh, a news in The Guardian telling that the Tory government buy a lot of AEPs for be in preparation for any kind of protest or riots for Brexit. Nevertheless, because of the COVID, that seems to never happen. But uh, the government was a, the, the Boris Johnson government was actually uh, uh, thinking in just them if there was some riots. And Omega Research Foundation has told me that the the, the Ministry of Defence of the UK has, is actually working in a new. Uh, in a new uh, projectile. Um, but what I found it like more, more, more complex is that this weapon was used initially uh, in this kind of colonial conflict, colonial modern conflict. But from the 2000 and onwards, it had been used more and more for dealing with crowd control. And because of that, a lot of people have been injured. Uh, and in Chile, the, uh, the, in the, 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 <laughs> the, in the National Institute of Human Rights uh, has recorded that more than 1,500 people were injured by this rubber pellet. Uh, the most trustworthy reports uh, show us that more than 180 people had ocular trauma and 85 people uh, were left blinded. What is very serious for the Chilean case that all these wounds happened between the 19th of October and the 20th of December of 2019. That's 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 huge. Like no, I have I haven't I haven't read any report with so many ocular trauma in so long in so uh, less time. Sorry, that haven't happened in such short period of time. Um, um, so now I'm going to start like, that was like a framework. I want to start picking up exactly what happened in Chile. Uh, I want to explain that we have two police forces. We have Carabinero de Chile and Poli Policía de Investigaciones. Um, Policía de Investigaciones focused mostly in investigating crimes. Uh, the huge police force in Chile are Carabineros and they, are, uh, they have different units for crowd control. They have a military structure 
And because of that, since the dictatorship, a lot of laws that are normally used to regulate the secrecy of the armies are also applies for, for them. So basically, we know very little of the kind of weapon that they buy, of the protocols, of, uh, of, the, of the technical assessment that they have made of their weapons. Um, this is a very important timeline to understand uh, what I'm going to discuss now. So in 2002, Alex Lemun, which was a 17 years old teenage, Mapuche teenager, was killed by Carabineros uh, using the gunshots. Between 2002 and 2019, at least seven Mapuches have been murdered by Carabineros, and at least six of them have been blinded. And there is a huge conflict. Um, so police violence in Chile for the last 20 years has mostly focused in people from, uh, uh, against people from, coming from minorities. Uh, poor people and actually indigenous populations. Uh, what happened in last year in 2019 in the in the, in the estallido social? It was it was the first time that police violence actually start being applied to anyone regardless their social position. So a lot of people that have never faced this kind of police violence, they discover for the first time uh, how the police dealt with protesters and, and this violence. Um, what is very important to, to know this is that in 2012 is the first uh, recorded use of the rubber backshots in Chile. They, uh, at least five people lost their, lost their eyesight because of these weapons. And there was such an outrage for this that the government asked police to actually develop guidelines and to actually start make, uh, to, to actually incorporate use of force guidelines. Mm -hmm. On this regard, uh, what we discovered is that because of that, in 2012, uh, Carabineros made a ballistic report. That ballistic report about the consequences or the behavior and consequences of the rubber backshot. That report was secret. It was leaked last year. And because we, 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 it was leaked, we know that Carabineros knew that this ammunition could kill at short distance that this ammunition were inaccurate and that these ammunitions should not be used for crowd control, despite the fact. What is more serious is that despite the fact that they knew this from, from 2012, in the, use of, in, the, in the use of force guidelines that they developed in 2013 and 2014, and later on in March of 2019, they never told the public the risk. They tell the rest of the people that these weapons were non-lethal, and that this weapon will be used uh, against non-lethal force. So basically, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to reach that, but it's very important. So um, very basically, I want to show a bit how this works. As you can see, um, as you can see, uh, that's the way that they start shooting. Um, they were uh, shooting this against a group of people. They were aiming, they were aiming to, to the, this fight. And I, and I want to explain why everything that he's doing here is very dangerous. And I'm going to explain um, why this explain why we have had so many people that were injured. Uh, so this is the protocol, it's in Spanish, but what I want to say is that uh, you can read that it said no letales, which means non lethal. So in 2009, when they update the guidelines of use of force, the police told us uh, that they was non lethal, despite the fact that they knew from, 2000, from 2012 that these weapons could be lethal at short distance and they could produce ocular trauma. This was only Spanish, but I want to explain that they have a continuum of force. In this continuum of force, Level four means that against any kind of uh, assault that do not put on risk the life of the, of the police, they can use non-lethal weapon. So if someone throw a rock and a tiny rock or trying to punch uh, a police officer and the police officer doesn't have any other weapon than the rubber batches, he can shoot them. And the regulations, the regulations do not say anything about not shooting them at certain distance. It has said anything that they should not shoot at the upper part of the body. So the problem is that they knew from 2012 that the, the risk, 
they do not incorporate this risk in the, in the regulation, despite the fact that this regulation from 2019 was published because Chile has an agreement uh, with the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights to publish and to update the use of, the use of force guidelines. So Chile has a commitment with the Inter-American because they have murdered people, the, because Carabineros has murdered people in the past, in the case, the case of Alex Lemun, this Mapuche people. So they have this international agreement and they didn't do it. Uh, this is the kind of ammunition. You can see that there are very tiny pellets. And the problem is that if, if from a ballistic perspective, because the kinetic impact projectiles works by transferring the kinetic force into the target, when you have very hard and tiny projectiles, they have a higher chance to penetrate the skin because it's like a knee, it's, it's like a nail penetrating skin. That's why when you look to France, Spain, and the UK, you see that the, the projectiles are very big. They are big because the bigger they are and the softer they are, the transference of kinetic impact is reduced. So therefore, part of the energy is, is retained in the projectile and not transferred to the target, which is avoid broken bones. However, Chile used tiny projectiles. And also the problem of these tiny projectiles that were hard, like it, it, it was um, rubber that was hardened with lead. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, this, in, this, uh, in the lower right part of it, you see uh, the X-ray of a patient and you can see a tiny, uh, a tiny white ball circle. That's a, that's a pellet. So because they were so small, they were easily uh, entered in the eye and the problem is that because they were hardened with lead and also they, were, they used very bad quality rubber, in many cases, people lost their eyesight because this, uh, the, the bad quality of the rubber and the lead make uh, an inflammatory um, uh, infection. So some people have lost their eyes because there was such infection that, that produced further damage. They also use super sock, which is a, an American um, weapon, which is basically a sock that contains uh, Kevlar, it's a, it's a Kevlar socks that contains lead inside. Um, they stopped using the, this in November last year because one of these uh, uh, projectiles uh, uh, hit the, the school of a protester and get inside the school. So they, they broke the school and get inside and they stopped. Uh, using this, uh, this ammunition, but they kept using the rubber boxes. Um, one statistic says that uh, they, last year, they fired 150,000 cartridge of these uh, rubber boxes. And you need to know that that means that if, if, if each uh, cartridge has 12 pellets, that means that they fire more than around, around 2 million uh, of projectiles to citizens, to, to, to people. Now, this is, the, this is the report of 2012 that was leaked in November last year. That, that can, like, I'm, I'm, so that allowed me to say that the police knew exactly what they were firing in. And this is in Spanish, but basically said that at five meters, they can broke bones. So therefore they can kill. At 10 meters, they can also break, break, break your school. At any distance, they can produce uh, a ocular, which is like the explosion of the eye, uh, and so on. So basically, the police in that report said that it was safe to fire these back shots only at 30 meters. So therefore, the, the regulation should have included a ban of use them at less than 30 meters. Police knew this. So in order to understand, uh, when you have back shoots, the, the, the pellets start this, uh, spreading as, as they advance. So therefore, the closer you are, more pellets are going to impact the target. The, uh, the, the far you are, the few will target, they hit the target. So the other problem is that when they fire at five meters, 10 of 12 uh, pellets arrive to the target. But when they fire at 30 meters, two of 12 arrive to the target. So here's the problem. The problem is that at close range, when there are more 
uh, when they are more accurate, they can kill. And more than 30 meters, when they are safe, you can injure almost anyone that is in the area. So the United Nations and all and Petition for Human Rights, um, Omega Reset Foundation, for years has told that you should not use multiple projectiles against crowd, against crowd because it's highly likely that you're going to injure people that are innocent. And that's the ballistic information that they should have known. And they knew this because of this report, and therefore they still use them. Uh, this is a, a, a part of a, a report that I work with uh, Scott Rainhood. And as you can see, the, problem, the other problem is that if, if I fire in the way, if I shot these uh, ammunitions in the way that the police that I showed you in the video shot them, uh, at, at long range, it's a high chance that I will hit the upper part of the body. So the way that they should have shot this is to is crouch, is to crouch and then shoot, uh, crouch it. Not point it to the floor, but actually crouch it. And they never do that, or rarely they do that. But all this information is like, they are, they are the normal regulation that they should have been used. And these are the normal regulation that should have been published and therefore they didn't. So what we know is that uh, this report was used to train policemen, the officers that were going to use them. So the report was used to train them, but they was not incorporated in the guidelines. They were told to not shoot at short distance they were told to not shoot at the upper part of the body. They were told that it was advisable to crouch before shooting, to avoid hitting the upper part of the body. They were warned that this uh, ammunition was inaccurate. However, they don't incorporate it in the, in, the, in the public guidelines. And now we know that police has an, a secret guidelines um, that are uh, an operation, they call it Manual de Operaciones, which is the actual real protocol on that secret. And we, if you try to ask for this uh, via a Freedom of Information Act, they told us that this is a national security. Uh, so therefore they apply the rules that you will expect being applied for the army and, and they're used against, so they, they, they protect themselves. Uh, uh, this, is, this is crazy. Um, so basically, if we start looking for the human right violations, uh, a lot of the prosecution work in the Chilean prosecution work has been focused into identify and to prosecute, okay, to prosecute the, um, the, individual, uh, the individual officers that use the weapons. However, after all this document that I have told you that our public and the prosecution know of it, uh, we need to start asking, well, who authorized the demolition? Who, why, who told not to make public the regulation that they should have been done? Like, wh why the training rules are not public? And who authorized the deployment of these weapons last year against, the, against the crowds? They knew that they may injure people and they use them anyway. And now police is saying, okay, we're going to replace these 12 pellets with three. And the problem is that because there are multi projectiles, they have the same issues that I have told you. And, and this is the, the technical uh, sheet by the, by the manufacturer of that munition. And it said that they are fired at 157 joules of force. So basically, at short distance, they, may, they can kill. Um, what I have been doing, and I'm going to finish with this, uh, I have been working with a network of human rights lawyers. We present a grid uh, of protection which is basically a remedy asking the court to ban uh, the use of these weapons. We present all the evidence that I have told you, but the court denied our rule. They said that for uh, the, that uh, because of a few isolated incidents, they cannot uh, ban the use of this ammunition despite the fact that we present all the technical evidence. So basically we have no, no one to ask uh, an illegal perspective for the ban of this um, uh, um, uh, ammunition. However, I helped to draft a law that was presented in the parliament uh, like three weeks ago. And because of the pressure that we have made, as I told you, police is want to change this ammunition for one of a free pellet. However, as I told you, uh, they have, they, they, um, it has the same problems. 
Um, uh, government has said that is, they should make a police reform, but they haven't done anything about it. Uh, one thing that is very concerning to me is that the Chilean government has asked help to the Met Police uh, for teaching them better uh, techniques. The problem is that Chilean police are using these relations to legitimize a lot of, uh, uh, of, of a lot of things that they do, like saying, "Oh, we ask uh, uh, English police to help us." But we know we don't know which were actually the the no the knowledge change change uh, like I like the, the 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 police forces in the UK has several controls that I do like, but I'm very concerned that like they are saying to the population, oh yeah yeah the English told us that this was what we should do in order to legitimize things that I don't know if they, that we don't know what the English tell them, and and it's very dangerous for us because they they try to to, it's, it's what we call gato partisan. They tell us that they do this, but they don't change what they're really doing. Um, very little cases of human rights violations by police has been uh, prosecuted. Uh, there is a lot of problems investigating this. So to close, I have just some, a few points for discussions, if you want uh, to engage. Um, there is such thing of the right to maim by the states. From a biopolitical analysis, I think that yes, like. Uh, but I think from the international law of human rights, there is no such thing of the right to maim, uh, and a state should not actually to defend the use of these weapons. Uh, which are the neoliberal consequences of the use of KIPS? Like something that I, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, in terms of uh, someone that is maimed by these weapons is not just her, is, is not just maimed. Uh, it's also something that will he will have to live for the rest of his life that will impact uh, his life. His work, his work, and also in Chile, they will have to pay uh, a higher uh, health insurance. Uh, the government has not offered any relief. They have not offered any apologies. And, and then there is this, this, this idea of the homo sacer comes to my mind, uh, Agamben. Uh, because when, when the government says, uh, you know what, I'm going to use these potentially maiming weapons against protesters, they're basically saying that any person that goes to protest has the risk to be maimed. So basically police, that, that, that means that police actually has the authorization, the legal authorization to maim people. Uh, and that will be, uh, what, I'm, I'm going to close with that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Javier. That was very fascinating. Um, virtual applause. <laughs> it's not the same as if we were in a room, but still. Um, so I'm going to open the floor now to any questions. If you want to ask a question out loud, just indicate it in the chat. Or if you want to write it in the chat instead, just write it and, and Deborah and Andrea will make, will read it out. So anyone want to ask a question? So I think we have one from Luke to start yeah. with. Um, if you want to speak, just feel free to interrupt me. But if not, I'll just read it out. So this is a minor follow up on uh, your point about anti austerity protesters being maimed by state actions through police brutality and the health and economic impact of such injuries. From your research or anecdotally, are you finding regular incidents of reporters, independent or corporate media being injured? Several such incidents have been documented in the US recently, as well as during the troubles in Ireland. Oh uh, yes, yes, uh, and and that's a there are there are actually videos of uh, an Argentinian police, so Argentinian journalist that was filming a police officer and the police officer. You can see how the police officer aimed at him and shoot him. Um, they this has become very complicated, uh, but um, they also uh, had been uh, injured people, uh, human rights observers. So there is no, there, there is several uh, cases that they have attacked uh, reporters. So that's an, an issue. Um, but they, um, the government has justified these decisions because saying that last year it was a, an exceptional uh, situation. However, you can find during the last 10 years in other kind of protest, police has also attacked journalists. So yes, yeah, we have found that in, in several cases. Thank you, Javier. 
Can um, we, I think Luke has a follow-up oh, no, to no, that, no, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Cheers, Abby. So as you said, the well, thank you for that answer, but I'm curious, you mentioned that the protesters who are there obviously by choice or by an urgent necessity, the state would not accept the responsibility for their injury. I'm therefore curious if the state actor and the police injure someone who is there reporting, for example, for a state broadcaster, is there any acceptance or are they deemed to have been choosing to put themselves in the line of fire, literally the same way the protester would be? No. Now, basically, in, in, in the only way that uh, uh, the government has been tried to make accountable, uh, a lot of criminal, uh, there are at least three or four criminal complaints against the President Piñera for violent human rights. But uh, the government has not made any kind of apologize, and therefore they haven't developed uh, um, any kind of uh, support, economical support. There is one small medical program that was stopped because of COVID. So therefore, in Chile, in order to make the government accountable, you have to sue them uh, in the civil law. Uh, and that's probably what is going to happen. Um, so, so, but right now the government says, you know what, I'm not going to acknowledge any injury until the prosecution prosecutes someone. And then we came to the problem that uh, rubber backshot done, doesn't leave a trace in the cannon of the weapons. So therefore you cannot trace the ammunition back to who they shoot them and the post deployment uh, 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 techniques by police uh, also are deficient. So we have many few people that are um, that have been prosecuted. Nevertheless, if the person can prove that the injury was caused by a pellet, they have a case. But then again, you have to sue the state. And for example, I, I'm going and, th and this will be a very good example. The, the five people lost their eyesight in, in Aysen in the protest in 2012. The case only finished with the conviction of the government and the, the, the obligation to, to pay it to that people um, two months ago, so eight years later. Um, so basically that's the kind of, uh, of, 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 of situation that we're living in. And we are currently, I think, uh, a couple of days um, away from the anniversary of, of this situation. And people are start going to the street again. And uh, two weeks ago, one police officer pushes uh, a kid, a teenager, uh, out of the bridge. Um, uh, there is video, you can, you can look for uh, the police officer pushing him. Uh, he was prosecuted, but well, police is claiming that was an accident. Uh, the prosecution is also investigating a cover up. Um, but very, I found very interesting your question because if, in, in a similar situation of what happened in, in uh, Kashmir, uh, people filming independent journalists are allowing people, are allowing prosecution to have evidence to prosecute. Uh, but in, not in many cases, not in all the cases, there were people filming. And actually, there is a very interesting point uh, from people in Kashmir saying that in this context, cameras and filming has become a new way of weapons against the state. Thank you very much, Javier, and Luke for your question as well. Um, I think we have Bridget um, that would like to make a comment. Do you want to unmute and make it uh, audio? Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Javier, I very much enjoyed your paper. Um, and uh, it was, of course, a deeply depressing one in its um, conclusion. Um, I wanted to take up uh, your point that you made about um, the colonial use of certain weapons. And I think this is very interesting. Um, you may or may not know, all of you, that the machine gun was originally invented at uh, the turn of the century and used um, by uh, the British colonial authorities and the German colonial authorities on their colonized people. Uh, for them, it was unthinkable to use it on any but colonized people 
because they were seen as um, not fully human beings. So when the First World War began, uh, it was um, argued that the machine guns should be used against the German army. And the British officers said, we cannot use it against German, use these weapons against German officers, which I think uh, gives an interesting insight into the class system and also uh, systematic uh, racism. Um, and uh, following on this, uh, to relate to what you were saying about Northern Ireland, I, I have been aware throughout my life that there have been different rules about police action in Northern Ireland and of course uh, the British Army's uh, use of uh, um, certain tactics and weapons, in including of course Diplock courts where usual court procedures didn't apply. Um, but I think now we have always feared that these same tactics which would be used in Britain and you're suggesting that we're about to see this transfer. Um, I think, for example, that uh, there were cases of people shooting to kill in Northern Ireland. Um, and we're now finding that police are shooting to kill here as well. Um, I don't know about Scotland, but certainly in England. And uh, the one just observation that I would want to make about that, it, there seems to be a transitional point when it, it perhaps is the case that they shoot against members of ethnic minorities. There's been one very interesting case recently where the shoot to kill policy was used um, against a member of an ethnic minority, um, but they won't do it against people they perceive as like themselves. Um, and uh, however, I have no um, uh, sense of confidence that people like me will be forever protected by this. I think it's quite likely were the, the civil um, uh, order to become extremely um, fraught uh, that the police would uh, change their rules. Uh, have you any observations about that, Javier? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's, it's great to see you again. It's lovely uh, to see you. And I, I, I agree with you. What I cannot fathom though is in which moment they the in Europe it became uh, tolerable to use them against citizens what I suspect is two things uh, um, I think that in France for example they because of the minority the, because they have a lot of immigration from the South Africa no, sorry from North Africa yes, I think they start uh, finding tolerable to use violence for immigrants or for minorities and a different violence for yeah. uh, citizens. Yeah. But that, yeah. I think that's how they start like introducing these we weapons and this violence and therefore uh, when the yellow best start protesting, they start using all of them against them. So the, I, I think like, um, again, it's like uh, what, what, I, what I still cannot figure it out is when this change is produced uh, when people stop realizing that these were colonial means and they start using them uh, in, in, in a context of protesting, of policy protesting. And I think that that's something that started changing in the late 90s and particularly something that had happened in the last 20 years. However, I think that England, because of the cautionary tale of Northern Ireland, this process has not been as fast as what happened in, in Spain and in, and in um, and in uh, France. However, in Chile, you found a similar story, like all these weapons of all this violence was used against indigenous populations um, in rural areas, in, in Temuco, in the Araucanía, uh, mm -hmm. and were never used them against protesters, despite the fact that we have several protests uh, where they could have used them. And they were only used them, they only decided to deploy them last year, because after the riot starts, the president says that we that the Chile was dealing with uh, a powerful enemy, and the president uh, make uh, after the in I think the 20th of October, he make a, a public announcement and he said that all the people that was protesting were enemies of the country and they should be dealt. 
-hmm. And after that, he ordered a curfew and he deployed army and uh, police officers and people do not stop protesting, violence increased and a lot of human rights violations ensued. Mm -hmm. um, so basically I, what I found is very interesting is like whenever they, they, the governments think that the protesters are not citizens or, or less than citizens, they are enemies, mm -hmm. we have the, this problem of the labeling, uh, mm -hmm. of the deshumanization, mm -hmm. um, the police feel that they can use these weapons and this violence. And, and the problem is that it, 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 what surprised me is like, how is that happening? Why we, we, we haven't started denouncing this more often or, or, or mm -hmm. like, I, I'm so, I mean, I can, I can solve that question, but I, I think there is a genealogy of violence, a genealogy of the use of these weapons and, and right now, if you look to what is going in the US, like Physician for Human Rights said that in the 30 years that they have been reporting human rights violations, this was the first time uh, that they have to report human rights violations within the US. Um, yeah, so that, I, 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 think, I think that's a very important point that um, there's a certain labeling of people as uh, enemies or less than human, which is required for you to be able to do this, um, like the Tutsis being labeled uh, as um, insects. Um, uh, and um, I, I think that this tipping point was reached, for example, in the Gilets Jaunes uh, protests in France, uh, where there were also cases of many people being very badly maimed by the, the French police. And you should look uh, to see whether it's the same kind of weapon that was used, but I suspect it might well have been. Anyway, yeah, I agree with you. Well, uh, thank you. Um, just to, to, to answer very quickly that point. Uh, well, I have contact uh, a French researcher and I have contact researcher in the, in the UK, Omega Research Foundation, and in the US and, and in Spain, and they are not using the same kind of weapon. Actually, the weapons they're using here in Europe, are, so there in Europe, are, are bullets or balls. They are less lethal mm -hmm. than the weapons that are using in Chile, but they, are, they, they, they have high chance to maim as well. Um, so therefore we are a bit like, like they're using uh, uh, another weapons, but you can argue with this case if is it better or not. And the, the response of the French government was the same response of the UK government. They don't withdraw this ammunition. They just introduce new ones. That, and again, they tell us that they are safer mm -hmm. and until you have main people and then this cycle start again. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Bridget and uh, Javier for that. That was really interesting. Um, something that I did not, I knew less about before. Um, we're wrapping up soon, but I see Lisette has one question. Do you want to speak or should Andrea read it out maybe? Yeah, I'll, I'll just read it and then the site can uh, interrupt me. Um, do you know any cases going to court from the blinded victims in Chile? Um, I think this is citation, Rodriguez et al. 2020, ocular trauma by kinetic impact projectiles during civil unrest in Chile from a clinician's perspective. It's the same message, not for crowd control. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Um, I'm working with Rodrigo, sorry, with Alvaro. Alvaro Rodriguez, I, we have been working together and we have been doing an, a training in workshop for the prosecution and the institutional uh, human, of, sorry, they did the National Institute of Human Rights. Actually, last Friday, we were doing a workshop for them. Um, so I have also worked with the prosecution. We have tried to provide all the evidence to the prosecution. So to answer your question, yes, there are thousands of cases that are currently under investigation, but for uh, they have only prosecuted um, around five people right now. Uh, the problem is not that we don't know that the, were, the victim was shot by the police. The problem is that it's very difficult to trace uh, an individual uh, um, uh, projectile with a specific uh, shooter. And the, so basically we know that the police shoot them, but we can't in, in individualize. And the problem is that because the prosecution has uh, doing a lot of work trying to identify the individual police officer that shoot, uh, the, the main investigation against the police command 
that authorized this has not moved forward. And so basically that's, that's the problem. The problem is that the cases are moving very slowly. There is a lot of, uh, of proof uh, evidence. And actually, I think like in a couple of more days, uh, uh, inter um, Amnesty International Chile is going to release a campaign uh, demanding for the, for the prosecution to investigate the police command. However, the government is offering all its support to the police. So it's very difficult right now. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if that answered your question. Oh, no, I think it, I think it did. Um, sí, gracias, Javier. So we're going to wrap up now. Um, Javier, thank you so much for, for your presentation. It was very insightful into a subject which is very important. So another round of applause for Javier. Virtual or silent applause. <laughs> I see loads of emoticons coming on. Yeah, Pablo's applause, applauding. <laughs> so thank you very much, Javier, and thank you for everyone that attended. Uh, we were very happy to have you here, and we hope that you will attend our next events. Uh, we will, like I said, we will email the email list. If you're not on the email list, then just let us know on Twitter or Facebook um, if you want to join the mailing list. Um, and uh, otherwise, follow us on Twitter or Facebook for um, the next event, which is coming up very soon, and the next series of events during the semester. So thank you everyone again, and we all, from uh, on behalf of me, Deborah, and Andrea, and Javier, have a lovely evening. Ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much for coming. No, thank, thank you, Javier. Thank you very much, Javier. Bye. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Javier. Bye. <laughs>